so Liz's claim to fame was that she wrote a blog article about uh, two years ago on what is learning to rank. And um, it was, if you Googled learning to rank, uh, her blog article and her diagram that she drew uh, was what came up as the uh, quick answer at the top of Google for about a year and a half. And then the Wikipedia Foundation, Wikimedia wrote an article and that eventually edged her down to the second spot. But uh, yeah, so very excited to have Liz here. Uh, she does a lot of speaking around search relevancy topics and I think we're gonna learn something interesting today. So, all right, Liz. Okay, so since we've had lots of excitement with, uh, with, with um, audiovisual, start off with something a little bit lighter than, than lots of probability. How many people have seen this picture before? No. Okay, then it's good that we're starting with a joke. That way when you're laughing, it's not at me. Um, so this, this is a spherical cow. And the story behind the spherical cow is that the milk production at the dairy farm was, was kind of low, so the farmer wrote off to the local university asking for some help from the professors, and they put a multidisciplinary team together and, and went out and you know studied, studied his farm and studied his cow, and they said, we'll get back to you. And they put the physicist in charge. And so why they put the physicist and not the veterinarians in charge is, is lost to history, but, but they did. And so you know he writes up the report, and he comes back, and he says, I have a solution, but it only works for a spherical cow in a vacuum. And so we have a spherical cow. That has nothing to do with the rest of my talk for another 10 slides or so, but you know. So hold on to that thought. So looking through today's the, the agenda for the, 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 for the Haystack Conference, there were at least nine or 10 talks that touch on the subject of evaluation, either techniques or tools or the lesson lear lessons learned, um, the, the machine learning that we're trying to build on top of, uh, on top of, the, uh, on top of the evaluation. And that's a huge percentage for, I mean, it's not that big a conference, right? Nine or, nine or 10 talks is a lot. So why? And the answer is because as a relevance community, we, we emphasize, or maybe to the point of angst, about what our users really think and feel and need out of their search engine. That's kind of what the definition of relevance is. And because most of us are still working from something along the lines of 10 blue bars on a page, then optimizing search means getting things in the right order on those 10 blue bars in the link. So in order to do that, either as a human or as a machine, then we need a way to measure mathematically exactly what it is we're trying to optimize. And we need to do that at a scale that parallels the complexity of the search experience we're trying to optimize. So we can start doing that with human users, and we've talked a couple of times about you know, it's kind of hard to do that with, with lots of people and a lot of them don't really want to. Um, so we want to do it off of our search logs. So this is not an implementation talk. This is, sit, let's sit down. If we want to build, if, if we want to build evaluations off of our click models, what does the math for that mean? And we'll start at pretty basic, um, but it gets kind of ugly kind of fast. So. Ah, thank you. So, an outline. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what measuring relevance look like and what the implications of that for doing off of our click logs are. Um, we'll talk about what the components of building an event model are. Um, a little bit about building one and how to use it once we got it. So. So what, what, what exactly is relevance? Um, the first thing to think about with any data problem is what is the question we are trying to answer, right? That, that going off on a dumpster dive might turn up something interesting, but it might just be a dumpster dive and we can you know, chuck lots of Swedish chef stuff, um, and, and, but we, it might or might not work. So I, when I say what is relevance, I don't mean in an abstract existential, we really love our users, because we do, but we, we really want to do it in kind of a mathematical sort of way. Um, so what do we do that? There are three, three pieces to that. Is a given document good for a given query? Is a given query or a given session successful in whatever we've set up our search system to do? 
And is the system overall doing what we've set it up to do? Because we're building custom search systems be as a tool. They don't exist because they're fun. They are, but that's not why we're building them. Um, and we're building them because there is a piece of information that somebody has to see, and that there are three levels that we need to measure that at. And because we're, we're, not, we're talking about this in a mathematically specific sort of way and, and not just, you know, we really love our users, um, there's some functions that people have come up with over the years to measure these. Um, NDG, and, and I won't go too far into the exact definitions of each of these because there are different reasons for using different ones. But NDGC, DCG, it, it's a favorite, favorite of how much good content comes out at the top of our result set. Um, and reciprocal rank is one that, that's been, been touted around a lot. Um, but, you know, further down, even moving down the, the complexity curve, precision, recall, what portion of documents were good or what, what portion of them came back. All of those, simpler or complex, all of those ranking functions need some a priori statement of exactly what is relevant and not relevant in the function. So the history for that, that by, by itself, that doesn't really seem all that complicated. Um, you know, back, back in, you know, circa 1960-something when they started doing all of this, then it was, you know, let's sit down with maybe 300,000 documents, maybe, and maybe 50 queries, and, you know, one zero, it's either relevant or it's not. That's probably something we could still mechanical Turk, but it's not the level of relevance that most of us are trying to get to. So we can ask people, you know, it, for a given query and a given document, tell me, was it good? Sure, it was awesome. Nah, it was terrible. Maybe it was pretty bad. Maybe it was okay. Um, but all of those are basically intended as statements that make sense to a human. And we can turn them into numbers, which is, is usually how we see our judgments. Um, and it, th those are still basically understandable to a human with just, you know, zero, one, two, they're nice integer labels. But if we start thinking about it a little bit differently, that's kind of a model, kind of, at a really rough level, right? We could write a function that says, for this function of a query and a document, give it a number. It would be really hard to generalize and it wouldn't look very pretty on a graph, but it is technically a function. So, but there's a reason that we don't use functions as, uh, or that, that we try not to use step functions for math, right? That, that they're, those gradations and those big drop-offs kind of cause some problems, and there's a different bucket of, you have to use, you know, so which bucket of math are we actually using, the one that, that can tolerate all of those step functions, or the ones that, that the calculus that they taught us in, in, in uh, school. Um, so what we'd really like to do, in, instead of making an absolute decision about, is this document good or bad, and do we need to separate whether the document is good or bad from if we are doing this as a human, we need to separate between whether the document is good or bad and whether the document is appropriate for a given query or not because you can have a really terrible document that's really great for exactly what somebody was asking for. And if we're asking people to, to set those labels, separating those two things as a human is, is pretty tricky. So what we really want is for a given query, what is the probability that this document is appropriate to that query? That it, what is the probability that this document satisfies the need for a given query? And there is still some of that notion that a really good, accurate, high-quality document might be more likely to, to, to provide the answer that somebody is looking for um, than one that's not. But inside our, I inside our function, what we really want to know is, is the document appropriate or not? I'm sorry for the notes, guys. So I didn't think of all this. Um, people who are much better at math than I did thought of all of this. This is the function for the expected reciprocal rank um, that by, by a team of folks, um, Olivia Chappelle being the, the main one and uh, Eric cited in his previous one. Um, and it's a metric that says, you know, let's just think about, you know, stepping down the pages on our document and whether our, thing, whether our query is doing well is, is some probability that the user stops its stops at R at, at a given rank in the document. And that, that's something we can talk and reason about and it makes sense in English, which is, which is always helpful for math. Um, 
But now how do we know when, what the probability a user is going to stop at R is? The, the, the equation is really helpful, but plugging in that, that, pl plugging in that P is not nothing either. So that's what we're trying to get to, is how do we fill in, what do we fill in for P? Does it matter if P is stops or something else? And how can we get there? So. So we need to measure relevance. We need judgments. Sorry, guys, but I can't see the. Um, so, so what are the pieces? If we're going to build a model to f try estimating what that P is, what are the pieces we need to get there? Um, first of all, let, let's spend some time talking about models in general. And this is a horse because when I originally learned the spherical cow joke, it was told with a horse, but um, that one, that version was slightly less appropriate to, to tell in front of a, a big group. So this is a horse, right? It's not an actual horse. Nobody's going to climb on him, and, and, and on the screen he's about 20 feet tall, which would be a really big horse. But every Everybody who's seen a horse and, and knows what the vocabulary word horse is knows that that's a horse. It's got four legs and a tail and the ears are not a donkey and it's a horse. And that one, that one's, you know, um, a lot more of the details are abstracted out that, you know, he's, he's, we've only got shading. It's black and white. Um, he appears to be missing one leg entirely and half of another, so he's kind of levitating in, in, in midair. But, we can all still tell that, that that's a horse. And this one has even less detail, and that's not a horse. That's a unicorn, um, mostly. But it's not very much of a unicorn. It, the only reason we really know it's a unicorn is it's got the, the little twiddly bit between its ears. So that's, that's what our model's going to be, right? That <laughs> we, what is the, the least little bit that we can do so that we can get the information that we want to out of it? without all of the extra stuff. We don't need a full photo photographic representation if we can get two ears and a horn. So. Okay, so. In general, reading directly off of your slides is bad, but since we're venturing back into math land and definitions matter, it's good to have the exact definition. Um, so instead of having a model of a horse, and preferably not a photographic model of a horse, then we need a mathematical model of our click logs. Then we need a mathematical statement that is going to define the relationship between something on our search page and some user event. And all of those things, because it's math, need to be defined a little bit more. But in general, we want a function that says, what is the probability of some event? And we'll say that that event is, 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 a, one, is, a, is a binary thing. Either it happens or it doesn't. So borrowing from, this is a, uh, there's a really excellent textbook by a, a guy named Alexander Trecklin and some of his friends um, at the University of Amsterdam. Um, it, the reference is cited at the end of this page that I highly recommend everyone go forth and, and, and read it, but it, it does have a lot of probability in it. That you, um, do your homework first. So there are four pieces if we're going to make a mathematical model and have an actual statement of what happens with our events. We need... What are we actually talking about? Both what are the events we're talking about and what is the random variable that we're talking about to describe how those events are going to happen. It is helpful if we can write that as a graph so that we know what's happening in our model because writing it in, in pictures is a little bit more clear so that we don't have too many mistakes in the math. And then we want to set some conditional probabilities along the edges in the graph so that we get, as we're trotting through, our, our users are trotting through their search page, then something's going to happen and how likely is it that something is going to happen. And that's the English statement that says, how do those, those probabilities and the edges in the graph actually tie back to our search page? Because otherwise, we're not modeling our search page. We're just drawing pretty connected dots. So walking through that in a really simple example. This is our blog page. Um, and if I go forth and do a search for synonyms on the OSC blog page, this is what you get back. All of the searches on our blog page return all of the results because we only have 776 articles. So you know, at some point, they might be worth scrolling through all of them. But if you, if you, if you query for synonyms, you get three things. 
The first one is about the match query parser, which is pretty old. And let's see. Oh, it's we're cut off, so we only get two on this uh, on this one. But two's enough. We got fewer impressions on this one. So, and the second one is on mapping multi-term synonyms. So, when I made the slides, we had three impressions, but on this graph, we only have two. We can see two articles. One slot, second slot. If we had the full slide, we'd see three slots. But so, so my math is based on three impressions, but we've only got two. So my math is going to be wrong on the next slide. So, and if we clicked on the one that we didn't see, <laughs> then, then that one would have gotten an impression and a click, but we can't see it, so we, that's going to make the universe blow up, so we'll, we'll pretend like we saw it. So, okay, if we're going to draw it, we said we needed a second thing, which is a dependency graph. So we had an impression, we saw it, or we kind of pretended like we saw it, and we decided it was interesting enough to read, so we clicked on it. Two of three events, three events. Two of those are things that we can measure, and one of them is not. Unfortunately, the one that we can't is the one that we're actually interested in. So if we write that, now we'll start making it look a little bit more like math, then we can start writing these wi with actual formulas. So the probability that we saw it, at, um, we go back and forth, I'll use E instead of I because capital I's and L's and ones and all of that, but, um, and also because in, in, in a lot of the papers they'll use the word imp um, examine and impression. I'm pretending like those two things mean exactly the same thing and in the model we're talking about they do mean exactly the same thing but they don't always depending on how precise you're being with your model. So the probability that I saw a document is epsilon, and the probability that it was interesting enough that, that, I, that I wanted to use it, that it was attracted to that document is alpha, um, and the probability that we clicked on it is then just a, an and. We saw it, and we're attracted to it. So we can solve, oh good, all the pieces aren't, because the last one's the one that mattered. Um, right, so we clicked it and we're attracted to it in substituting in our math, it's a multiplication. We can measure two of those, so if we have really good click logs, we can measure two of those pieces. Um, we'll talk in a minute what happens if we can't measure both of those pieces, but for right now, we're pretending that we measured both of the impressions and the clicks. Then we can just solve for the one we're interested in, like this, right? That if I have 20 clicks and 200 sessions, and if I had a pointer, I would point, but um, instead, I'll sing and dance. Yeah. Um, if we had 200 sessions, so then the probability of an examine is just somebody saw it divided by the number of sessions. Probability of a click is the clicks divided by the number of sessions relevant to this particular query. And we divide out what the attractiveness score for that guy looks like. Which is a really long derivation for a metric that's about as old as advertising on the internet. Um, this is just click-through rate, number of impressions, the number of clicks divided by the number of impressions times 100. Um, it shows up in your Google Analytics. It even shows up in the free Google Analytics for your site. Um, how many people are already using click-through rate? Right. So we didn't really need to derive the whole thing. But, but it's worth it because the math for that, we can make really complicated math for a pretty simple thing. But if we want to get more complicated, Nobody, uh, that didn't show up one. That one's a cartoon. So clicking around on the site doesn't actually tell us everything we need to know, right? That it's nice if they like the documents that are on our site, right? But that, t that tells us as much about the UX as to whether we're actually giving them good information. What we really want to know is whether we met their information needs. So now we have two things that we can't, now, now we have two things that we can't measure directly. And so let's look at that. So I still have my impressions, and that's a probability. I still have the, the probability that someone's attracted to it. I still have the probability that a click is that they saw it and they're attracted to it. And then we have to add this new parameter, which also barely now fits on the screen, which is that the, the document actually met their information need and they were satisfied by the thing that they saw. So, and we add a new dot to our exam and it says they only saw it if they, they were attracted to it and they clicked on it and we hope they were satisfied. And that may or may not be something we can measure either. That click-through rate has a, ha, has a companion metric, which is conversion rate, right? We could, and so in theory, we could, we could use that for our satisfaction and say if we have conversions, then it must have done what it needed to do, and we can divide out for that. But, but what if we can't? 
that defining, so, so now we have two variables that, we, that we're really quite interested in the answers to, and actually if they're different, that's also quite interesting because that's probably something we should go tweak in the UX. But um, what, what if we can't? That not all search systems have nice clear-cut conversions. And honestly, a lot of the ones that do, how that ties back into whether it actually met your search need is still kind of a tricky problem. So we start stringing together and connect the dots. And maybe then we can approximate for them. So this is a slightly more complicated version of, of uh, the click models. We're still basically in the range of, of click through for, for, for complexity. But now, if we, can't if we can't measure everything that's there, what do we need to solve for? Um, this is and we start using statistics. So the equations for this are basically the, param the ones that we sh showed before. But we need to make a few more assumptions if we're going to be able to solve for this. And that is, so they're all, we're, we're going to start off again. They're still, they only are going to click on it if they saw it and they liked it. Same assumption we were making before for a click through. And there's still some click through rate at rank R on the page, or if we're being really detailed, rank R for a query. Um, and we're going to say that they're going to click at the, the, the next chunk of equations are another way of making simple things complicated. We're just saying they read through the blue bars in order. Right, they, start at, they start at one, so the probability that they examine the first link on the page is going to be one. If they make a search, they see the first thing that comes after that. The probability that they click on something, if the, one, if they didn't, if the probability that they look at something, if they didn't look at the previous one, they, if they didn't look at the previous one, they're not going to see the one that we've got. The probability that they keep clicking after they, after they like something, that's our sigma, right? That we're going to pretend, like, if some, we're going to pretend that if someone keeps clicking on the documents that come after, that they must not have liked the one that came before. And again, like I said, for, from a model complexity perspective, this is still on the same order. This, this is not a lot past our, our, the click-through that we had, right? That there are lots of reasons that people might drop off after, they that after they've clicked on a document, and other than, than that they actually liked it enough to, to finish the session. And that's this last line, that, that we need some parameter in our system of what our, our users' tolerance is for getting fed up and, and just leaving. So, but if we, but that's something that we can, that, that we can solve out for still, because the probability they clicked on it is still that they, saw, that they saw it. The probability that they click on something is still that they saw it and we're attracted to it. And even though our rules for whether they see things further down are uh, slightly uglier, they're still, they saw it and they were, and they were attra and they attracted to it. So we can write for after the, remember we said the first guy is one, and we can write out that they're ever going to make it and click on the, on the guy that came after. And now there are four parameters in our order model. And there's, it's still not very, comp and, and it's still not very sophisticated, right? So alpha and epsilon we talked about already. Sigma is that they're satisfied, and gamma is that they're going to keep going. If we have logs that, that we really like, then we can still measure our impressions and clicks. Or we can, you know, so, so whether it's, you know, we still don't know if they were actually satisfied with it, but we can guess, or attracted to it, sorry. But we have to estimate for gamma and sigma. And this is what that comes, comes out to. But. So, and this, w w if we, this is back to, to continuing our, our horses' sphere. How many lines do we have to keep adding to build it up, right? If we're, this is a, th this, there is a citation there. I didn't do this because my drawing is, you know, about as good as my singing and dancing. But, um, right, how many lines do we have to add to the page? How many more layers do we have to add into the model? And how many parameters do we have to add into our model before we start getting something that will describe enough of the system at a query and a document? at a query and a document before it starts getting useful. And what do we have to plug it into to actually solve for those? On our click-through rate, we don't have to have a model 
and we don't have to do anything really fancy for to, to get click through out of our impressions and clicks. We just need to have enough logging to know what our impressions and clicks are. Um, and and the, 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 the math word for solving for the thing that you're interested in is match, maximum likelihood estimator. Um, there's some more math that goes with that too, but really it just says solve for the thing that you want. Um, but for the ones that we can't see, then we have to get fancier. The technique that, that shows up in a couple of Python libraries and the guy who wrote the book and, um, is expectation maxim the expectation maximization algorithm. EM because I can't say that many syllables in a row. Um, we can't solve directly for all of the stuff that we want in our DBN and anything that's more complicated that comes after it. So, and part of the reason for that is because the probability for those little satisfaction parameters depends on the stuff that happened before them, which means there's a recursive element and that takes a little bit of time to calculate. So there is an iterative model fitting technique to do that. And the intuition behind that which is also taken from someone else who's much better at math, um, is pretend that we're flipping a coin. And, and we all know that if we flip a coin, then it's either heads or tails. And that's whether the, the rate, the distribution that it's heads or tails at is, is the parameter in that model. And if we want to flip two coins, then you know, maybe our coins, you know, one of them is fair and one of them is not, and we keep flipping them. And so the idea is that you're trying to guess the, the fairness of one coin and the fairness of the other coin without knowing which, which coin your flip came from in the first place. So you're going to guess at how fair the first coin is, and you're going to guess how fair the second coin is, and then mix everything up. Calculate how likely it is that any given series of flips came from one or the other, and then try again. So rin rinse, lather, and repeat. Except we don't really care about coin tosses. We want to know about you know, satisfaction. And so continuing with our beating our dead horse, um, which they came out really blurry. So he's real. This one's actually a horse, not, not a cow. Um, <coughs> that once we do all of this, that with, with something as simple as click through, we can kind of ha have a, a gut check that, that our math came out right on the other side. Um, and this is more complicated and, and perhaps that we can't. So we need to know how to measure and w make sure that we've got our horse standing in a sphere and not an actual spherical horse. So how do we evaluate models? That if we had a fairly simple model that is not probabilistic, then m most of us here probably understand mean squared error. Right, I got a bunch of points, and I'll just see how measure how far off they are and, and add all of that up. Um, the log likelihood error is pretty much the same idea, except that we're doing that, we're taking the log of both sides and not using the mean um, to, to solve for things. If you are doing this in Python or R or your numerical package of choice, there will be libraries to help you with your, your log likelihoods. Um, although you will have to plug in the thing you're taking a log likelihood of. So, and we need to know how well our model fit, fits on repeated sample sets, right? Um, so we run it and we run it again. And again, so, so we've built this thing. And we've made it the level of, of complexity that, 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 we can that, that we can still handle. Um, so now that we've got this thing, how, how do we use it? We put it back in our judgment lists, of course, right? That now we have, we have a way of generating for any given query document the satisfaction that comes out on the other side of it because, sorry. Because once we have enough models filled into our, once I'm, we have enough models that we filled in, enough parameters filled in to the model, then we can take the pieces we can measure, and the pieces that we can't. So in this one, I'm still pretending like we can we can solve that that, that we can solve for our, our alphas and epsilons, but we needed to calculate gamma. Then we can calculate out the pieces that we need.
and come up with something that looks like this. And that lets us drop back in and calculate all of those metrics that we wanted to calculate before, but we didn't have any judgments to do it with. Um, and the other piece of that is that when we drop these back into our judgments, we're going to have documents that we say we have no we have no judgments for at all. But now, and, and so previously, if you're calculating NDGC or something like that, we have to assume that those are either all good or all bad because we only have categories to drop those things into. And if we don't know what they are, where do they land on the system? Um, now we have some kind of a now we have some kind of a system metric, right? That if, if we're calculating out sigma for uh, you know, the third slot on the page, is it more accurate to say that this thing is all good or all bad, or is it more, more accurate to say that without any more information, it acts exactly like the third thing on the page for every other query in the site? It's not very, it's less accurate than actually being able to calculate the big ugly thing that we had up there, but it might be better than nothing. And it also plugs back into some of our simpler metrics Right, that, that if, if one of the problems we have with NDGC is that where, where good is on that curve and, and having a, a gut check it, um, set it on the numbers makes it harder to iterate and actually use the, the metrics that we're calculating, then can we, can we plug it back into our simpler metrics? And mathematically, I don't know, but um, it makes sense to say, you know, if I've got five things on the page, what, does, what is the average precision of the stuff on my page that, right, is that this, what is the average? What is the average ranking of these five things? And regenerate, re regenerating models. One of the chronic problems with human judgments is that they expire, right? That that unless we take some careful measures, like keeping track of the, the time of query, I, th I think was what the uh, they were doing in the previous talk. Um, Unless we're really careful about it, then those judgments stop being useful in fairly short order. But we don't really know how long it takes for them to expire. The technique that we are using, the, the internal numbers from expectation maximization, is we are tracking the parameters and we are tracking how they converge. And we are testing whether it is good enough by checking whether it converges on the numbers that we gave it and on, on the numbers that we gave it and on the samples that come afterwards. And so at what point do samples that come after, the samples that come after will be different because you know variation happens, but at some point it'll start converging less or it, it, they'll, it'll drift further apart. Um, and that's, that's something that kind of we're interested in and how fast they change and where we put the threshold is is going to be something we're building up a tolerance for. But eventually, if we're lucky, we can get it to a point and say, hey, now we know that you know, our model parameter is no longer neatly fitting our live data, so we really need to, to scrap the whole thing and, and retrain it. Um, whether that's something that we can get, could put an alert on, probably not for a while. So likewise, um, <coughs> likewise, we're interested in which queries are performing well, right? That if we're saying that we're treating these things as probabilities and we're treating and we're measuring them by how well that, or how likely they are that they came from the distribution that's described by the model we started with, then is that something that we can take for a set of queries and check? It did, is this qu set of queries described by the same model that fits our whole system, our system as a whole? And the answer is probably not, but, but how far off is it and is it off enough that we shouldn't be applying those parameters from the first one? Um, so, o overall, that, that using categorical judgments is, is, is appropriate for human readers, but it's, it's, not, it, it's a lot more challenging to reason about and it's a lot more challenging to solve for in, if, we're, if we're using computer ratings. So let, let's, let's start to stop talking about our ratings. As, as these one, two, three, four, five things and start talking about them as probabilities because you know, no, we, we can deal with numbers from zero to one. Um, and, and the math makes sense. The math works with our, the math works both with the, the metrics we've been using for you know, 25 years or, or uh, click has been around for a while. Um, and the math works with the summary metrics that we're using also. Um, some of them better than others. NDGC does some kind of weird things once you start chopping your, cropping the range of your 
of irrelevance. Um, but, but most of the others behave sensibly. So if we have enough click logs, then we can solve for really simple models directly. In fact, we're already doing it, most of us. Um, but there, there are techniques to, to estimate more complicated ones. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Uh, that's hard when you don't have your deck in front of you. So, all right. Do we have some? Qu yes, excellent. Some questions. So, now you get to watch me run around. Um, earlier in the talk, it sounded like you had made an assertion that when we're looking at when we're judging the impressions people were going to start at the top and we were going to figure out how many impressions were made by when that click was and so if they click on five they've been impressed with one through five if my users show that they scan somewhat randomly you know they're mm -hmm. drawn to number 10 and then we're convinced that we lose the assertion that we can infer impression for the others with that lack of information how would that affect the overall model so, so the first thing is that if if it means that there are lots and lots of models that these are this is these are two right, right. Um, and so that that the one that I started with is that is is click ba based on click through because I expected that there was going to be a lot of hands raised that says yeah we already know what click look, click through is things, um, but it it random is actually also a model and there is you you could you can solve for. It, it has a single probability. You don't even have to draw the connect the dots, right? And so you can, what is the, what, what, what is the pattern of traffic look like if users actually randomly click on the documents on our site? What is the probability that this, this guy gets, click, gets clicked on by random, what's the, the, and this one by random, and this one by random, and this one by random? But I don't mean it so much that the click is random, but that the, that the, that the ranks actually don't matter. So if the rank of every hit on a page is equal. And so we can't depend on a scan across that. Right, sorry, I, I said click, but, but it's, so this model is, is requiring it, it, that, that things happen in order because they're trying to solve for two things that, that, that they're, they're, tr they're, they're trying, they're, they're fixing the number of uh, events by what happens before it in the list, right? And so if you're, if you're not starting at, at one, then you basically, you're not solving, you can't make the statement that epsilon looks like that, right? And so at that point, epsilon becomes random. And that, that's another parameter that you estimate. Cool, thanks. Uh, great talk, thanks. Um, my question might be a slight variation of that. If you do have results and they are ranked, and they might be the same, but that's not where I'm going. If someone picks five, they're attracted to five, but in some way they're implying that one through four aren't as attractive. Can you get an implied other signal out of that to enhance the model? That is exactly what this model is assuming, actually, okay. is that if, if they kept going, um, that, that, that they so there, it is. It is a probab. So, so it's the impression, and that's why it's 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 the impression is also a probability, right? So you get a click with probability whatever if they're attracted to it. So there's also a one minus alpha probability that they were attracted to it and didn't click on it. Um, it it's it's a probability. So you don't know you don't know that they weren't attracted to it, but we're saying it's more likely that they. Right, I understood the DBN. I was just saying if they did a single click on five, somehow one through four, they've done nothing else with that query, just a single iteration through the DBN and they're done. They liked five. Maybe it implies that one through four. It's not, you know, they saw the impression. It's not attractive, but it's another mid-signal of maybe not as attractive or something that could enhance the model in a single click. No? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's, I think we're saying the same thing. Okay. But. Uh, are there any recommendations for combining the attractiveness and the satisfaction together for judgment lists? So, I think, I mean, 
I think that that's basically what we've been doing for a lot of the one, two, three, four, five that we've talked about beforehand. Um, as a gut check, I'm curious as to what, what happens if we leave them separate, right? That, that um, it seems like it would be a useful signal if there are documents that are, if there are documents that have, right, if something has a high click through and, and a low conversion, um, to, to stick to the, the model that we've got up here. Um, that's kind of a useful signal. Um, so, both? <laughs> so TBD. Yeah. I got to hustle to the other side. All right. Are there any pitfalls you'd look out for for um, choosing a model? Like overfitting is a common problem with a lot of modeling. So I think in general it's a good recommendation to start as simple as you can, right? That that um, even if we're if we're if we're talking with, with sketches, right? The one line at a time, as opposed to we're not all Da Vinci, um, or sorry, Dega. Um, that that start simple and 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 layer in complexity, um, and what I do not have sufficient empirical evidence for, but is a, a good gut check. Um, the EM is you pick something and iterate. That it seems likely that if you have a similar parameter in a much simpler model, that the pick something and er iterate, a good place to start would be what's coming out of your simpler model. Although that may not always be mathematically sound either, depending on how. Uh, hello, uh, here. Uh, uh, since we are generating this judgment list from all the sessions uh, on the website. Uh, how does this change when we actually want to build a personalized model? Like, uh, because this is more generalized, we're getting the probabilities based on a general, uh, based on all the sessions and not with respect to a particular user because for a particular user, the preference might be different. How are we, how can we actually generate the judgment scores? for a personalized model. And second question is like, how do you actually uh, evaluate these judgment uh, probabilities which you generate? Is there a, some framework or some best practices around that? So the, the, uh, the, the guy who wrote the book that I'm referencing here has a GitHub library, um, which I, there's a link in the slides to his, his library because he's better at math than I am. Um, so that was the, the second question. The first question about personalization, the problem that you're going to run into very quickly there is that depending on how complex your user models are, there's not going to be enough data that says for this user, this, for, for this user all of these queries are accurate and for this user all these queries are accurate. Um, and so piecing out which, pa which parts of your model, which part of your user model are relevant to which patterns in your query set are, go are going to be, you're, you're going to have to, to, to group them together at some level, um, right? That it's, it's, right here we're talking about a query as just, we're, we're talking about a query as just a keyword because it fits on the side nicely, but yeah, your queries are gonna be more complicated than that. Um, and so if you can use, if you can just use keyword, that's pretty coarse and doesn't tell you anything about what your personalization is. Um, but um, the example that I, I use for learning to rank is bicycles, right? That if we have sparkly handlebars for a three-year-old and a messenger bike for, or a, a road bike for a, a messenger in New York, then there needs to be some signal that says users who are in this age bracket buy this kind of bike, users who are in this profession buy this kind of bike. And so the exact combination of however old our, our messenger bike person was um, and his profession, right, that, that we may not have anybody else that's exactly like him on both of those counts, but if that's something that we're targeting, we should have other people that are in that profession or so other people that are that in, in the aspects that we are trying to train for. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, I think that's all we have time for, but I know, but Liz is around, so I know she'd love to talk more about this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Liz.